correct answer is neither. <laughs> right? <laughs> so you don't want this skinny guy that never gains any weight and never eats uh, because he doesn't make you any money. But you also don't want this girl that's super overweight because she's expensive to keep, right? She eats too much. And for the amount she eats, she might not make you enough money to offset what you have to pay for her. And so this is kind of the crux of the feed efficiency question. Which animal eats just enough to make you the most money when you go to sell that animal um, on, on a carcass scale? And so that's kind of the point of feed efficiency analysis. So um, when we did kind of this exploratory work in feed efficiency for Beefmaster, we said knowing that you can single trait select for feed efficiency and say I want the most feed efficient animal, um, that will cost you a lot because you might end up with animals that don't gain. And so um, Colin and Lance said we want to make sure that whatever we end up publishing is not going to be something that's going to get everybody into trouble with animals that don't gain or don't eat and things like that. And so um, what we ended up settling on was residual feed intake and a feed efficiency index for a genetic improvement tool on feed efficiency. And I think that residual feed intake is kind of a confusing trait. Um, it, you know, there's a lot of talk about it in the industry, but the question is, what is it actually? That's always my question. What is it actually? Um, and so, really, residual feed intake is just on-test feed intake adjusted for weight gain. So it's just dry matter intake adjusted for weight gain or with weight gain held constant. Um, and another thing that was important to the Beef Master Association we, when we did this was back fat deposition. We wanted to make sure that these animals weren't losing a lot of fat or gaining a lot of fat. We wanted to make sure that that stayed the same because you want to make sure that your animals are still depositing fat in all the right places, right? For you to continue to have good marbling animals. So that was important when we did this. This is the equation for feed intake. Um, I know it's in the afternoon and we're right before the cocktail hour, so everybody stay with me on this equation. The point on residual feed intake is in the name. We're, we're selecting on a residual. Um, and the reason that we do that is because we want to be able to select for feed intake without really affecting gain or back fat a whole lot. Okay, so that's sort of the point of RFI. And so we analyzed about 2,800 residual feed intake records, which is a good amount. And then Dr. Herring did a great job talking about contemporary grouping, but I'm just going to reiterate it here. It's really important in genetic analysis to have a good contemporary group, especially in feed intake, so you know that they were given the same chance to eat and the same chance to gain. And so the kind of um, base contemporary group is animals that are in the same herd and the same year and the same season. And so the residual feed in, intake contemporary group, group includes weaning contemporary group and pen and start date. So what you're really trying to say is were those animals exposed the same to the same amount of feed in the same weather conditions kind of a thing. That's the point of the contemporary group. And I think that, so I'm a geneticist, and there's this geneticist joke that um, an introverted geneticist stares at their feet when they talk to you, and an extroverted geneticist stares at your feet when they talk to you, okay? And so I don't think we're great at basic communication. And so I always want to just make sure that we talk about raw data for a second uh, before we step make the next step and talk about EPDs and genetic analysis. The reason we like EPDs is because raw data, raw feed intake, say dry matter intake, you can't compare that between animals with dams that have different ages, animals that are different genders, animals from different environments in the same herd, so across the road from each other like we talked about earlier, animals with different birth years, and animals from different herds. 
And so because you cannot compare the raw data between all of those things, that's why we want to select on EPDs. Because the way that we incorporate contemporary grouping into EPDs means that we can start to select for animals by comparing them to each other from different birds, from different bird years, from different calving seasons, let's say. That's why it's so important. And so uh, data cleanliness has really been um, you know, a priority with the Beefmaster Association, certainly since I came on board and I'm sure before then as well. Um, and so we came up with a couple of recommendations just to make sure that your RFI analysis is as accurate as possible. What we don't want to happen is for you to say, well, this animal performed great on test, but his EPDs are horrible. You know, that might happen sometimes because of other factors. But for the most part, we want to make sure that the EPDs accurately reflect um, the ability of that animal to be a parent. And so we recommended that the weaning weight record for these animals has to be within acceptable BBU parameters. Um, that's 150 to 1300 pounds. And I'm pretty sure Lance has these tattooed on his arm right here. So if you go up to him, just ask him about it, about the parameters. Um, and then also, we suggested that specifically scan fat always be collected on these animals that have the feed efficiency records included in the analysis. And the reason for that is, is we want to make sure that their deposition of fat, fat is still within the acceptable balance. Okay. And so here's just some summary information just for what you can expect. Um, I think if I understand correctly, this was just rolled out for the membership, what, Lance, last month, the feed efficiency EPs? Uh, two months yeah, ago. Two months ago, okay. Um, and so just for what you can expect, the minimum RFI EP is a negative 1, 1.5. The maximum is a 1.3. Um, with an average of 0.02. Um, there's some really inaccurate animals, which means they probably don't have any parents tested. They're, you know, not tested themselves. They're just related to, to animals that have been tested. Um, but the maximum accuracy is about a 0.87, which is pretty accurate. That means that animal has been tested. That animal's progeny has been tested. They all probably have genomic tests that add to their accuracy. And so I feel pretty good about that. And the point of that accuracy is that you guys, as breeders, can make good progress in your herds by selecting on these, on these highly accurate animals. Um, and it was also moderately heritable. Um, and I think that researchers like to throw that word around a lot. But basically what it means is, if I select on this, am I going to be able to make progress? And the answer is yes, you'll be able to make progress similar to selecting on weaning weight or birth weight uh, by selecting on RFI. Uh, and I do just want to mention when it comes to data submission, um, sometimes people get into this thing where they say, you know, I, I tested all of these animals, but these animals really didn't do well, and so I'm not going to submit their records to the association. And that's like, that is not the right thing, <laughs> okay? Uh, that's dangerous. Um, and the reason for that is EPDs are all about comparison. And so if you don't submit your core animals, then you're pushing your average performance up. And so your really high performing animals then just end up looking average. So, you know, in an EPD analysis, your core animals are just as important, if not more important, than your high performing animals, okay? We also um, created an index, and I know that there was a question about index selection earlier, and I'm so glad I heard that, um, because especially for a trait like feed efficiency, where you can really go down a bad path if you're single trait selecting, index selection is a really great alternative because you're selecting on many traits at once, and it keeps them in balance, okay? And you're also able to make better progress um, through that index selection than you would by kind of single trait selecting on all those different traits. Um, and so I put the economic values up here. What we do is we simulate, um, we set up a simulation based on some economic values, um, and then we put in the traits, every trait, 
that's involved in this analysis, and the simulation kind of tells us which traits are more important for feed efficiency um, and what to weight them as. And I think in the, um, in the industry, people get really caught up on these economic values, and they also get really caught up on the weights. Um, but more important than the specific economic values is the distance between them, or how they rank animals relative to each other. So you could actually multiply all of these economic values by 500, but if they're still the same distance, if they're not flipped, um, between each other, then they're going to rank animals in the index the same, okay? So it's about the distance or the separation between the two sets of economic values that's important. So in the um, BBU uh, feed efficiency index, which I think is called dollar FE, there's residual feed intake and then yearly weight and weaning weight that are a function of a post-weaning gain number that we calculate. And I mentioned index weights as something that people get really caught up on, um, but I want to just talk about correlations between the index and the component traits. When you're asking what's the weight on something in an index, I think what you actually mean to say is what traits are in this index, and if I select on this index, how are those traits going to change? I think that's the point there. And so um, the feed efficiency index obviously is highly weighted towards RFI in a negative way, so you want less residual feed intake, um, but you also want to keep your weaning weight and yearling weight pressure up so that you're selecting animals that do still continue to gain even though they're eating less. And then we essentially hold back fat at zero. So that's a small number, 0.06 we're essentially holding that constant. We don't want it to change, okay? And so these are the correlations with the component traits for feed efficiency. Um, and I think this slide is pretty important just to remember as you're thinking about selecting your animals for this feed efficiency index, um, because it's important to know how traits in your herd are gonna change through selection on an index. Um, there's other indexes in the industry where breeders have really gone gung-ho after selecting on those indexes and it's very much changed kind of the shape of their breed. Um, and so it's really important to pay attention to component traits. I just wanted to pull out a couple of animals. These are real animals with real performance data from the BBU database. Um, you can see the RFI of the top bowl. These are all APDs negative 1.23, uh, and the bottom bowl is negative 0.64, and then the post weaning gain number of bowl number one is 28, and bowl number two is only 17 for post weaning gain, and then the dollar FE of bowl number one is 52, and bowl number two has a dollar FE of 29. And so kind of the point I want to show here is, bowl number one um, has a lower RFI number, so he's eating less, but his post weaning gain is more, and therefore his feed efficiency index is more. And so you can kind of see how that shakes out. If you have a bull number two where their RFI EPD is higher, which means he's eating more, but he's not gaining as much, his feed efficiency index is going to be lower. Okay? And um, the index values are, are in units of dollars. So you can say, you know, bull number one could potentially be making about 30 more dollars than bull number two, or 20 more dollars in this case. And I did just want to talk about, um, you guys have had a really busy year, <laughs> um, breed improvement wise. Uh, we've done a lot of projects this year. So we did the RFI EPD, and we did dollar FE, um, and then we also did a lot around just sort of data management and making sure data was clean and that the parameters for our data cleaning fit your current herds. And so, for example, um, there's minimum and maximum values for um, RFI, current scan RFI parameters that are, sub that are submitted to the association. Uh, we looked at those and looked at acceptable values and, and changed them a little bit based on your current herd. And, um, you know, I think we do that every two or three years or so. So that was something important uh, to make sure that that was clean. 
Um, and I think sometimes people worry a lot about accurate data. Like, what if the guy down the road isn't submitting accurate data? How's that going to change my animals and how my animals look in the evaluation? And, you know, we've looked at some of that. And the good thing about the beef master evaluation is that there are so many animals in it, so many genotypes in it, that um, <coughs> one producer set of questionable data isn't going to hugely affect the rest of you. The correlations, when we looked at taking, you know, certain data sets out and stuff were very, very similar between runs. So we also did a stability update. Um, so it used to be that we assumed that any cow that was active had a good stability estimate. Uh, but then we went back and said, not only was that cow active, but she had to have calves as well. You can't just keep your favorite cow. You know, she's got to have calves. Um, and so we define success in stability as animals that remain in the herd through their fifth year and have at least two, three calves before 2,000 years of age, 2,000 days of age, which is approximately five and a half years old. Yeah, not years. Um, and then we also did an age at first calf update. Um, we looked at the difference between animals that calve at 30 months and the animals that calve at 24 months for the first time. Um, you know, how does it affect that age of calf EPE if we dock those animals that calve at 30 months for the first time? And there really was no huge change in the age of calf age at first calf EPD if we docked those animals at 30 months because everybody in their whole contemporary group would probably have at 30 months. And so one thing that we want to look at in 2022 is actually looking at age at first calf for animals at 24 months and age at first calf for animals at 30 months and run those as two separate traits but that are correlated together to see if we can figure out a little bit more exactly how that's working in the BBU data. We also want uh, to do a mature cow weight EPD. That's actually in the works right now. Um, you all have about 2,000 records of that, and so that's about enough to start selecting on it um, in an expected progeny difference. And then we also want to make sure that we make adjustments to the index with all of the new EPDs that you guys have going. And so, you know, potentially putting RFI in a female index, potentially putting mature cow weight in a female index to better reflect how those efficient females can stay in the herd. And then we also want to look at the correlations um, in stability from age 3 to age 10. You know, there's a lot of chatter about this in the industry and not a lot of common thought. So if you have an animal that stays in the herd until 5, does that mean she'll stay in the herd until 10? Um, chances are that that's the same trait, but some people say no. And so we want to look at this specifically in the beef master data uh, because that loss indicus influence really does change stability and it extends it actually well past 10 usually. So we want to look at that a little bit closer and make sure that we're doing the best stability number um, that's most correlated with your data. So I'm happy to answer any questions, or I'll also be around this evening at the meet and greet if you'd like to try and do that. It relates to ages versus cat, and we're not talking about this, but I had an ongoing uh, complaint or unhappiness that it's kind of figured on an in herd basis instead of a breed wide basis. I think our bone customers, when they look at age first calf, they're assuming that those animals are genetically superior or having calves will calf earlier. And the way we've got it structured, and it continues to be structured, because even though we made the change, you said this still doesn't correlate, we're still selecting for, if an animal can calve at 36 months, as long as they calf earlier in their own calving period, they're considered superior to one of calves at 24 months, even though that's actually not true genetically. So I, I think it's kind of untrue, at least to the name, from our commercial bull buyer's perspective. You know what I, I, I keep pushing them to get to get a better fix, but we seem to keep arriving kind of at the same point. Yeah, and we would agree with you, and so that's why I think the next step is looking at those as two separate traits um, and, you know, adjusting the contemporary groups that way so that you're saying everybody that calves at 30 months, how do they compare to each other, and then running them as correlated traits. 
Uh, but you know, there is room for things like they might be 99% genetically correlated. And if that's the case, then running them as two separate, separate traits won't be as helpful. But it's definitely on our list next to look at that. Yes? Do you have a formula for calculating the RFI and so RFI comes as on-test RFI from Vitelli. So it's on-test RFI um, in the GrowSafe trial. And then we run that in as an EPD. So it's just like if you submit a weaning weight, we don't calculate an EPD, or we don't calculate a weaning weight. We use the weaning rate record that you submit to calculate. Do you have a numerator, denominator, or anything like that when you're calculating? No, it comes as phenotypic RFI, so it comes as a number. We looked at that, and I want to say, so we did do a calculation of RFI, and so what that just is is a regression of dry matter intake and average daily gain, and then looking at that regression, uh, but it actually wasn't as correlated to the phenotypes is actually just taking the phenotypic RFI from GrowSafe. And I think the reason for that is, is you're looking at on-test gain in GrowSafe, and that really does make a difference when you're calculating the RFI. So do you, eat, if you walk out in the pack and you have easy keepers that are looking good flesh all the time, are those are more feed efficient animals by just looking, or is that? But you don't know how much they're eating, right? <laughs> you know? Everybody else is eating. Yeah, but they they are not eating the same amount, surely. You know, because I think we all have that one cow that's like first to the feed line always. Doesn't let anybody else eat. Those do exist, and then, you know, the cows that never get to eat or eat the scraps of everybody else. She might be your most feed efficient animal because she's still putting on an acceptable amount of weight with almost no feed. So that's why RFI is really difficult to get at just looking at an animal. It's not quite the same as like your weight treats, for example. Is it possible that RFI PPDs will lead you to a smaller mature cow herd as yeah. far as size of cow? So I think if you were single trait selecting on feed intake, you would end up selecting for a smaller animal. Um, the hope with RFI is that it is genetically independent of gain and intake. But that doesn't mean it's phenotypically independent. So if you single trait select on RFI, you can end up with a smaller animal. And that's why I think the index is pretty important uh, to look at, just to make sure that you're accounting for all those things. Uh, our data by Kelly would say it's independent of cow size. Well, I'm going to talk about that tomorrow in my talk, so I invite you tomorrow morning and, and we'll look at all the different ways you can select the feed efficiency and we'll uh, take a deeper dive into RFI. I will say that one thing about RFI is that it is favors or you could go the wrong direction with it on harder doing animals as well, they look really good, like a calf gets sick or something like that. So you got to really look at your outliers because he's not eating much, so he looks good on his RFI. Mm -hmm. So um, those outliers are out there that you have to kind of be careful of as well. That's a great point. Yeah. Uh, Jerry, touch on what we did with the phenotypic fat with our RFI. Oh, so we looked at, um, when we looked at calculating RFI, um, sort of just with dry matter intake and average daily gain, we looked at including back fat in that calculation as sort of, you know, you end up with the residual number by including dry matter intake, average daily gain, and back fat. Um, but that calculation was not as accurate as phenotypic RFI from GrowSafe adjusted for the back fat feed. And so those are run as correlated traits now, um, just to make sure that you stay sort of in the guardrails there and don't end up in animals that don't deposit any fat. Bryce, did you have another question? No, I, I'd say maybe one of the reasons that correlation is better is because we have a very standardized protocol mm -hmm. that we make everybody walk through before they start trial. 
and before we'll certify that they've had enough valid days to end the trial. And so that standardization makes me happy because it's telling you we're producing better data. That's right. And I think, and I said this, the gain component where you're looking at on-test gain is really important because you're saying over this same period the animal ate this much and gained this much instead of saying the animal ate this much over this period and gained this much over a different period of time. So I think that standardization is good. Yeah. Yes. It's something that people get caught up in a little bit is not understanding the, uh, the testing that's done with the tele uh, AI gross <coughs> uh, is that you, know, you might have a set of cows or, or a set of heifers or a set of bull yearlings in a pen and you're putting out 20, 30 pounds of feet a day uh, multiplied by whatever the number is. Well, who's to say that that animal, dog, going back to your thing, you have that on? On grass, who's eating what? You know, you really can't calculate it unless you've got to meet individually. And so you really don't, even though they might look the same, there's always going to be some that are going to eat more than others. And it certainly shows up with the testing that's being done through these uh, gross safe systems and, and various other pieces. That's a great point. Yes. Uh, as far as contemporary groups, you know, we get we get told, we get scolded because we only have contemporary groups of five or six versus 30, but at least we have a contemporary group. How much more of an advantage is it to have a contemporary group of 30 versus a contemporary group of five or six? So really, any contemporary groups over three are good. Um, you might get more accuracy out of those groups of 30 head in a contemporary group, but really once you get around five or six, surely 10, that's about, you know, you're about capturing the same amount of accuracy. So from a, from a genetic evaluation standpoint. And BBU does a really good job of not breaking up contemporary groups too small. Um, you know, they're constantly looking at your contemporary grouping, making sure that there's not anything strange going on. And so I feel very confident in how you guys are doing them. Well, thanks everyone for having me.